One of the news stories of the last week or so was that Ellen DeGeneres is caught up in a little bit of a scandal involving our boy, George W. Bush. She attended a football game in the presence of the 43rd president, and there was a bit of a Twitter war between Ellen and the progressive community. Ellen claims that people just don't get that she was trying to be civil and that a gay Hollywood liberal and a conservative Republican can be friends. She is, of course, massively simplifying an issue and gliding over exactly what makes George W. Bush so terrible. I'm not going to get into all the things that makes him terrible. That would take more time than I possibly have. But what I will do instead is continue my series on his campaign manifesto, A Charge to Keep. This time we're looking at a chapter called Working Together, which is ironically quite fitting for this Ellen controversy since this is all about his ability to be bipartisan and work with Democrats. As with Ellen, the Democrats he worked with are by no means liberal or progressive. Ellen was gay, therefore she was in favor of gay marriage. Once gay marriage was secured, she no longer gave a fuck about any liberal cause. That's kind of how conservative Democrats and conservatives in general work. They're not concerned about larger causes when it comes to people's rights, unless they're part of that group. And if you're a conservative and you disagree, let me know, but you're wrong. And in the recording of this video, what I'm going to be doing is making frequent stops. Since the last time I tried to do this, I lost a lot of uh, time because my file was corrupted on PowerPoint. So what I'm doing is dividing all of the slides into smaller chunks. So you'll hear a fair number of clicks you normally would not hear on a video of this type. I don't know why I'm explaining this very basic methodology. Maybe it's just my apprehension about reading this piece of shit book. Okay, let's read this piece of shit book. Chapter 9, Working Together. I never used a nickname to his face, but I'm sure he heard about it and was probably secretly pleased. It was an affectionate way to recognize his power and influence, and the way he could bulldoze those who got in the way of doing what he thought was right for Texas. Called Bully. I would say to my staff, check in and see what Bully thinks about it. Hi, I'm Bullock, the slight man had said, beckoning me into the living room of his West Austin home. Yes, sir, and I'm George W. Bush, I replied, an inauspicious beginning to the most unusual friendship of my life. George W. Bush wants us to think that in all of his many adventures, including in his drunken years, that his most interesting friendship was with a Democrat who was a lieutenant governor and ideologically was more or less indistinguishable from George W. Bush and as we'll see was basically his ally on literally every issue. I don't see where that is unusual. They are basically identical in their political beliefs. They just have slightly different personalities and backgrounds. Uh, you know, odd statement to make calling that an odd friendship. It's really not that odd. Bullock, Bully, in my Rolodex of nicknames, he gives a lot of nicknames, that is true. George W. Bush had nicknames for pretty much everybody in his inner circle when he was president. I believe his nickname for Karl Rove was Turd Blossom. I don't know what he called Dick Cheney, I think it was just Vice or something like that. Was Bob Bullock, the Democratic Lieutenant Governor, most often described as the most powerful politician in Texas. Lieutenant Governors are independently elected in our state. Bullock was the last remaining giant of a past era, when Texas politicians and their personalities seemed larger than life. Adjectives cannot begin to describe him. He was a man of outsized passions and famous faults. He was frequently outrageous, sometimes crass, often funny, always cunning. He was unpredictable, volcanic in his language, rough-hewn, yet surprisingly tender-hearted. This is, of course, effectively a eulogy to Lieutenant Governor Bullock, who died shortly before the 2000 campaign. So George W. Bush was able to find some dead Democrat and really play up their friendship to the point where we don't actually know how true it all is, since Bullock was not around to confirm or deny the claims that were being made about him. Since George W. Bush was on the surface extremely kind to the memory of Bullock, I doubt that any of his relatives were too upset. He also basically called him the last of this 
great generation of over-the-top Texan politicians, and I'm sure that that would be something that he would want, uh, Bullock, I mean, like that, that he'd want in his legacy. You always want to be the last of something if you can. I mean, it's better than being the third last that no one will care about. His temper was legendary. At one point or another, he fired almost all of his staffers, many of them several times. They were uh, they wore it as a badge of honor. You hadn't arrived as a true Bullockian, as they proudly called themselves, until you made Bullock mad enough to fire you at least once. He was difficult, no impossible, to work for. So, basically, he was the Amy Klobuchar of Texas but in an era when politicians could be complete and total assholes to their staffers and no one would get too offended because that was just kind of expected. He demanded that his employees wear beepers, which he would use to find them in the middle of the night. If they arrived at the office any time after 6 o'clock or 6.30 a.m., he was already there, and that meant that they were already behind. He would tear up work that he felt wasn't adequate, this is for Texas, he would tell them. You can do better. So, just like George W. Bush, he's an extreme morning person, and he cares more about being prompt than anything else. So you can see how unusual this friendship is, and how these two men couldn't possibly get along. You can also see how, as a lieutenant governor had the same priorities as Bush, but a much sterner personality, he wouldn't compliment Bush's good cop at all. Like, you can see why this is definitely an odd couple, and there have been no friendships of this nature in human history. Bullock had been an institution in state government since 1956. He's old. He served two terms in the Texas House, was an assistant attorney general, a governor's appointment secretary, the secretary of state, and then was elected and served 16 years as the Texas comptroller. He controlled the money and thus much of state government. He was the Nucky Thompson of Texas. As comptroller, actually also comptroller uh, is a Cyril Figgis word, he set the revenue estimate that determined how much money legislators could spend. He controlled the timing of the estimates, could choose when to make revenue updates that made additional money available, and would do so at key moments that suited his purposes. He revolutionized the comptroller's office, brought it into the modern age of computers and technology, his staff members were highly sought after by other agencies. People who had graduated from the Bob Bullock School of Public Service were hardworking, knowledgeable, and tough. Bullock had a network of people loyal to him throughout state government. So in other words, George W. Bush had to make friends with this guy because he knew everyone who was anyone, and he was the key to getting bipartisan support. Since he already had a network established, all George W. Bush had to do was butter him up, and then he could utilize that network. Pretty simple, and it's pretty clear what George W. Bush was doing here. Bullock was a lifelong Democrat, and as lieutenant governor, he was the leader of the Texas Senate, which still had, at the time of my election in 1994, a Democratic majority. Bullock was not of my party or my generation. He was a crafty master of the political process, not inclined to think much of a rookie like me. And when he says that this guy is a political master and not a member of his generation, I think it is worth noting that I honestly think, and this is not an insult to baby boomers, but they might be the most politically inept generation of all time, and both in terms of being able to vote their own interest and in terms of being effective in office. Um, once baby boomers really started to come into office in mass numbers in the 80s, the kinds of legislation that we were passing was piss poor, and it has been for a long time. Um, no offense again to boomers, but I do suspect that once boomers are more out of power, our political process will improve. Boomers were good at a lot of things, but politics sure as fuck isn't one of them. Yet I knew that if I became the governor of Texas somehow, I would have to get along with him. Visiting his home during the final weeks of the 1994 campaign was the first step. I thought I was done to win, and I hoped Bullock would be impressed by my overture would think that the visit was a bold move. We spent a couple of hours talking about our mutual love for Texas. We talked about policy, not politics, because they agree on policy, and the politics were largely irrelevant since the state was rapidly turning red, and Bullock knew that his continued survival and relevance would depend on working with Republicans. 
Again, this is not hard to figure out. Mostly I listened, and he talked. Conversations with Bullock were often a monologue. Yeah, it's because George W. Bush is not a motor mouth. Right. But by the time I left, I felt confident that we could work together. And after I won the election, I continued my outreach. I called Governor Bullock and the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, also a Democrat, Pete Laney. I told them I respected them and wanted to work with them for the good of Texas. I knew that only by working together could we all be successful. Joe Alba and I met with Speaker Laney at the Four Seasons Hotel a day or two after the election. The Speaker, a West Texan who I think was proud to see a fellow West Texan as governor, telegraphed an important willingness to work with me for the good of our state. Governor, we're not going to let you fail, he said. Pete Laney is a cotton farmer. He's a man of the land. It's hard to overstate what that means. He understands storms and insects and bad luck and bad weather. It's actually very easy to overestimate and overstate what that means when you're applying it to politics. Bush is here making a major metaphor between farming and politics without realizing that metaphors by their very nature often do overstate a thing to clarify it. But, of course, George W. Bush is a man of action, not a man of words. Pete has had to work hard for everything he has accomplished in life. He is steady, a patient tiller in the soil of the legislative process. He knows that good legislation, like a good crop, requires work and time. He knows the need for sun and care and watering between planting and harvesting. Pete brought a touch of prairie populism to the Texas house. We differed on key issues, including school choice, home equity lending, and some tort reforms, but we respected our differences and became friends. So Bush had some disagreements of substance, but he tried to smooth those over by schmoozing. And it doesn't sound like Pete Laney was any kind of a liberal firebrand. He was willing to cave in to most of Bush's agenda, plus Bullock was pretty hard right. So Laney had not much support, not to mention, as I've said a couple times now, Texas was trending hard red at this time. Pete is the strong leader of a dying breed, the rural conservative Democrats who have dominated Texas politics since Reconstruction. The Texas House still has a narrow Democratic majority, but that is changing. Conservative Democrats are being replaced by Republicans. The safe Democratic districts are now more likely urban, inner city, majority minority, and moderate or liberal. So effectively, the takeover of the Republicans is increasing partisanship and division in Texas, and Texas politics is becoming more um, polarized. Well, I, I've seen that actually when I have met Texas Democrats. Texas Democrats are fairly solidly liberal, much more so than most Southern Democrats you meet, and they're also extremely outspoken about their views, which I kind of like. But um, I imagine that is partly a result of what George W. Bush is talking about here, this kind of polarization uh, of the two parties in Texas. Republicans have seen a dramatic increase in our numbers from 19 out of 150 in 1978 to 72 today. Pete recognized the changes by sharing power and delegating a lot of authority and responsibility to key committee chairmen, most of them Democrats, but some Republicans. Some don't think he shares enough. Those he shares with usually think he handles it just right. Laney commands great loyalty. His team likes and respects him. So basically, since Laney's own people are happy with him and his opposition is not, even though he's of the other party, Bush can appreciate a good partisan hack, since that is at heart what he is. If you'll recall, as president, George W. Bush had zero Democrats in his cabinet and gave the Democrats basically nothing for eight years. So he knows he might be able to talk a good game about bipartisanship, but George W. Bush does not actually play bipartisan politics. On a certain level, I kind of respect that, or at least I would if his agenda and record were not so horrible as it is. Pete and Bob came to see me in the transition office when I was setting up the administration, the first of many regular get-togethers. So again, George W. Bush's tactic for getting through life is schmoozing. First, second, and third option. We agreed to meet every week.
during the legislative session for breakfast, and I invited them to the governor's mansion for the first Wednesday morning. Bullock complained that the food was too healthy, not greasy enough, so from then on we alternated between the speaker's apartment on the west side of the Capitol and Bullock's office on the east side. We usually had biscuits, gravy, and eggs, and my favorite, pancakes. We had some indigestion, and it wasn't always because of the food. We were strong-willed people who sometimes had strong differences, but we met and we talked. We kept each other's confidence in our commitments, and gradually we built trust and friendship. These must have been tactical disagreements because, again, he called Laney a conservative Democrat who had a few differences with him. As we'll see, Bullock pretty much was the champion of all of the shit Bush wanted to do, so ideologically they were completely on the same page. Maybe because Bullock was a lifelong Democrat, he wanted Bush to give appointments and favors to some of his friends or something, and that's what they butted heads over. But there were no substantive differences in these meetings. These were all minor things. So this proves literally nothing that these three men were able to sit down and work towards shared goals. That is not an example of leadership uh, or bipartisanship in a meaningful sense. Bullock and Laney have challenging jobs. Leaders of the legislative branch of government work to bring diverse individuals and causes to a common conclusion. Someone once compared it to herding cats trying to guide and direct independent creatures who tend to wander off in a lot of different directions. The goal is to get to the end of the session with good legislation and no unnecessary partisan cat fights. Sure, there may be some hissing and spitting, but no blood. Basically what he's saying is everybody has to actually agree when it matters but you can take some cheap pot shots at one another or get down in the dirt and fight over details that ultimately don't really matter that much. The Texas legislature meets for only 140 days every two years. I joke that some Texans would rather that the legislature meet for only two days every 140 years. Again, George W. Bush with that rapier-like wit. We like to say in Texas, if government doesn't meet, it can't hurt you. Short legislative sessions force discipline and focus. They also require legislators who want to get things done to check partisanship at the door. More importantly, however, short legislative seasons make it easy for someone to hone a very good golf game. You can guess which part of that I just added. There is a natural tension, some competition, between the House and the Senate in any legislative body. The House believes it is the home of true debate, that only the House with 150 members and more committee chairmen than the Senate has members, gives legislation the thorough, nitty-gritty scrubbing it needs. Debate is more rambunctious in the House, where members line up at the microphone to have their say. Senators each have their own microphones. The Senate believes it is more statesmanlike, that its members see the bigger picture, Senators represent five times as many people, have bigger budgets, bigger staffs, and some House members would say bigger egos. Because, you know, politicians, only the bad ones have egos. I mean, uh, most people who think that they're more qualified than all of their neighbors and friends and everybody they've known to do something, leave their ego at the door. They don't carry that with them. I mean, certainly egotistical people who run for president don't tend to do well because, uh, you know, it, it, that's not what makes someone want to run for president. Ego just can't be a factor. Duh. Pete Laney likes to remind senators who first served in the House that they are house broke. So imagine uh, Pete Laney, that was like his one great contribution to political discourse, is that people who served in the House under him were house broke. No one else had ever thought of that, I'm sure. Laney is a master of brinksmanship. What some people don't know about Pete is that in addition to farming, he also owns a used car dealership. Now that is a recommendation. He knows how to negotiate. The House withholds action, takes its own time as the Senate passes a lot of bills. Then power shifts to the House. The House can work with the legislation, wait until the last possible moment, and with the pressure on, the Senate may be forced to accept House changes or face losing the legislation altogether. And so many of our meetings consisted of Bullock urging Laney to get moving. Bullock was a talker. He played his cards. Laney held his cards close to his vest. 
Bullock would try to dictate a solution. Laney would finesse one. At the table were two very different Democrats and a new Republican governor, all with key roles in the process. Um, they're not very different, though. One is more conservative than the other, but they're both conservative Democrats. The difference is tactical. One is more reserved, one is more loud. And also, the way that Bush sets this up, the way that they interact with each other, what the fuck is he there for? Because it sounds like his associates, these two conservative Democrats, are running his Republican governorship. He's just there to watch them debate and haggle and crap legislation and maybe add a few words here or there and a couple of jokes and give them nicknames. I mean, he's made himself out to be a pure mascot. That's what he's describing. Our early meetings were push and pull. Bullock would thrust and I'd jab back. That sounds like something out of a gay porn. We were testing each other, probing. Yeah. Hmm. Bullock always kept you on edge. He could surprise you with an insight, antagonize you suddenly with an unexpected shot, talk forever, then abruptly end the meeting. Laney was calmer, harder to read. He didn't wear his emotions as much on his sleeve. The meetings were sometimes tense, always interesting, and often full of laughs. Pete had a story to fit every situation. Bullock had stories, too, outrageous ones that you could never repeat in polite company. So basically, uh, Bullock was the man, and his stories were so outrageous that they were not safe for work. And you certainly can't say them in front of ladies, because that would be inappropriate and out of keeping with Bush's effort to restore dignity and uh, propriety to America after the hedonism of Bill Clinton. What follows in this book really makes me wonder if George W. Bush thought of his governorship as a job that you just take and then you train on the job for it and figure it out as you go. I worked hard to learn the legislative process and get to know individual legislators. So he's implying that he had no idea how the sausage was made in Texas prior to entering the governor's mansion. That seems irresponsible and stupid to step into an executive role that you know nothing about. I knew if I had strong relations with members, I would have stronger relations with their leaders. I would unexpectedly drop by their offices, surprising receptionists and young legislative aides. I invited them to lunch or breakfast or dinner. So he's telling us in literal words that he was out to lunch the whole time. I was accessible, always willing to see members who told my legislative staff they wanted to talk with me. I met with the House Republican Caucus and spent a lot of time with committee chairs from both bodies and both parties. Hugo Berlanga, a Democrat and House committee chair, later told me he spent a lot more time with me than he ever had with any Democratic governor. The point here is that Bush really likes people a lot, works very hard to butter them up, and that his theory of power is that it is who you know, not what you know, that gets results and that gets things done. So basically, he is the embodiment of the social networking theory of power. Now comes one of the most bullshit passages in this entire book, which is saying a hell of a lot. I'm an observer, a listener, and a learner. We all had, uh, we all would run for office for a reason. I wanted to hear what was important to each member, what he or she hoped to accomplish during the session. I was convinced that through patience and respect and listening to each other, we could find common ground. So, uh, Bush might be an observer, but he doesn't really listen or learn. He listens insofar as he learns about you as a person. He doesn't care about your priorities. He befriends you and uses that friendship to try to accomplish his own ends. One of the reasons why he's befriending Ellen right now so publicly is that he's trying to connect himself with someone with a positive public image so that way that helps in his rehabilitation. As recently as 2016, Bush was completely radioactive and for good reason. But once Trump got elected, people started to look back on Bush and think maybe he wasn't that bad. 
and Bush is trying to take advantage of that by coming out of hiding and appearing with people who are generally viewed favorably. Since Trump is universally hated by all Democrats now, Bush can butter up some establishment Democrats, appear with them, take pictures with a smile, and now he's a good guy all, all of a sudden. This is George W. If you have read this book, that should come as no surprise to you. That's what Bush is doing now after his failed presidency. My staff jokes that you can tell what the legislator, legislature thinks of the governor because the legislature begins its session before the governor is even inaugurated. But because I had campaigned on specific reforms, I felt I had a good start on the legislative process. The public had, after all, endorsed my agenda by electing me. So what Bush outlines here is actually important. You have to have a specific platform when you're running for an office. Some of the Democrats now like the idea of the generic Democrat. I have even a couple of older friends who will try to defend the generic Democrat campaign of 2004 when the party ordered John Kerry to be as generic and lifeless as humanly possible and just be an alternative to Bush with the D after his name. You can't do that and expect to win. And even if you do win, you come in with a mandate to do nothing but just be there. Joe Biden is trying to do that right now, going into the 2020 race. This strategy of running on nothing and then just coasting does not work, and it guarantees you either defeat in the moment or defeat later when you have sat there for four years on your hands. I used my state-of-the-art address, or wait, state-of-the-state state address. I was giving him way too much credit. State of the state address to underscore the point. My campaign had focused on four key areas, reforms in education, welfare, juvenile justice, and tort reform. As we'll see, one of these was way more important to Bush than the others, despite the listed order. The press was tired of my single-minded focus on the same four. They were ready for number five. Here it is, I joked during my state of the state address. Number five, I said, is to pass the first four. Bullock loved it. Of course, he added that if I had said something about titties or, you know, cow tipping or something like that, he'd have liked it more because that's more in line with his sense of humor. But, you know, I like a good dad joke that I can repeat in a book or on the campaign trail that establishes me as a good Christian man who will restore the dignity to the office that Bill Clinton sullied by getting his dick sucked in the Oval Office. There were some moments of high drama, moments when legislation hung in the balance. Early in the session, Bullock decided he was going to take the bull by the horns and get the issue of tort reform resolved or out of the way for good. So he's saying that Bullock is the guy, as a Democrat, who was really desperate to pass tort reform. In other words, Bullock not only was culturally conservative, he was a corporate Democrat. He was working for the wealthy. He had no interest in the interest of the workers. This explains why he and George W. Bush were best friends. During my campaign, I had outlined a package of tort reform bills designed to curb frivolous and junk lawsuits, stop excessive punitive damage awards, and end the practice of forum shopping that allowed plaintiffs to file their cases almost anywhere they thought would give them a friendly judge or jury. I took on the trial lawyers directly and won trial lawyers gave millions of dollars to my opponent, yet the public had agreed with my call to end the frivolous and junk lawsuits that clogged the courts and threaten our small business owners and entrepreneurs. So the idea is that if you can sue as a group against a corporation, which is effectively a group of rich investors, then that is a miscarriage of justice and it's unfair. Also, trial lawyers are apparently terrible and those aren't real lawyers. The real lawyers that you need are the corporate lawyers who make backroom deals or threaten people into signing releases. Those are the good lawyers, but the lawyers who actually do what they do in public in front of the people and occasionally even fight for things that are just, now those guys are assholes and they need to be shut down. And apparently also all of the trial lawyers are Democrats which I don't think is actually true, but uh, according to him, uh, according to a lot of Republicans, especially from that era, 
the idea is that trial lawyers were Democrats to a man, and that's part of why Republicans wanted to shut the door on tort reform is because trial lawyers were giving a lot of money to the Democratic Party. The trial lawyers had lost the election. They weren't running, dumbass. But they hadn't lost a legislative battle, at least not yet. I knew they wouldn't quit without a fight. They are savvy veterans of the legislative process. To be fair, at one point, I was in a political science class, 2007-ish, uh, and the at the time, 65% of all people in the U.S. Congress were lawyers by training. So he's probably right about that. And I worried that the issue could be targeted for filibuster or killed on a procedural move. So I declared the tort reform package a legislative emergency to highlight the issue's importance and make sure it didn't get bogged down in the legislative process. Yes, God forbid that a legislative process gets bogged down in the legislative process. That we should actually have to debate and haggle about some part of legislation in the legislative process. I mean, that's just absurd. And clearly, tort reform has to be the biggest crisis of all time. I mean, how would businesses exploit people and get away with producing harmful products without this legislation in place to protect them from consequences? I mean, asking people who make billions of dollars to take risk in their businesses, how unthinkable, how inhumane, my God, what victims? I mean, that is an emergency. This is far more serious than when a hurricane devastates a place like Houston. I mean, this is a fucking tragedy. I, I, I'm crying. I can't help it. I'm just crying Cory Booker style right now. But I forgot to turn on the camera so you could see. This is absurd. And if anything, this is actually more absurd and ridiculous than Trump's border emergency thing that he was trying to do. It's another case of an issue that's been a thing for decades and which was by no means at its lowest point. And then you have a, a president or a governor just declaring an emergency, even though it's clear to anyone with a brain that there is no emergency to speak of. Or if there, if there is an emergency, it's something that's been going on for long enough that you can no longer consider it a crisis unless you literally don't give a shit about the meaning of words. I want my man in there, I told Bullock when he told me he was going to convene a working group to negotiate the details of tort reform. The governor wants his man in the negotiations, so he's going to be here, Bullock had said, introducing my policy director, Vance McMahon, to the group of key Senate and House members and plaintiffs and defense attorneys. So, the way he phrases it here, Vance McMahon is his political hatchet man. Of course, we've met him before. He did, I think, the, all the appointments for Bush or something like that, or maybe he was the budget director. Um, but by calling him his man, he's, a, he's essentially saying that either Vance was his hatchet man or else his secret lover. And if he was, in fact, Bush's secret lover, that would have been an interesting thing to throw into the campaign dynamics, especially in 2004, when Bush was campaigning against gay marriage, of course. Bullock had assembled the group, as only Bullock could do, and ordered them to work it out, as only Bullock could do. So apparently Bullock was the only competent person in the Bush administration. That's what I'm taking away from this. George W. Bush, whose number one priority was pleasing his rich donors with tort reform, had no idea how to pass tort reform. Years later, while eulogizing Bullock, I joked that I was glad I was not St. Peter. Bullock's got him locked in a room and he's not going to let him out until he's happy with the details of his plan for eternity, I said, to knowing laughter from the crowd of Bullock's closest friends. They were friends, in case you didn't catch on to that. George and uh, Bullock besties. And everybody knows that they're besties. They attended the funeral where Bush delivered the eulogy. And since they were of different parties and had such an odd friendship, it's very touching. And you should be moved to tears by the idea of two men liking each other while working against your best interest. The first issue on the tort reform table was punitive damages, and the negotiators were stuck. Punitive damages have nothing to do with a victim's actual damages. They are intended to punish a defendant for extraordinarily negligent or malicious behavior. So in other words, that is a deterrent for not engaging in bad behavior. 
This is a deterrent for making faulty products or providing fraudulent services. This is intended to protect the public. This is intended to provide a good standard of living for people. George W. Bush, of course, cares nothing about that. But too often, that was not how they were being used. They were being used to terrorize small business owners and force higher and higher out-of-cost settlements. Punitive damages of tens of millions of dollars became all too common, even when the dispute involved actual damages that were much smaller. I've seen a lot of cases where companies will put out products that do a hell of a lot of damage to the people who paid money for them, and in some cases resulted in serious health problems or deaths. I imagine that Bush is gliding right over that and pretending that the only relevant example is the McDonald's coffee incident, which, by the way, was actually an instance where McDonald's was negligent. You do not have to make coffee hot enough to inflict legitimate uh, life-threatening burns. Um, I don't know if you've ever made coffee, but it does not have to be hot enough to boil your skin away in order to become good coffee. So I, I don't know. I don't think he brings that example up, but that's one that Republicans were really pushing hard in the early 2000s, at least. A major employer had closed its Fort Worth plant and moved 600 jobs out of Texas in 1992 because, its chairman said, of Texas's liability laws and the excessively large awards routinely given by Texas juries. So all this is, of course, is just a horror story to blame victims in a race to the bottom. This is simply an attempt by Bush to repeat the claim of an executive who was trying to allay the anger of a community by shifting the blame onto Texas politicians. Clearly, uh, this person was doing what he did to make money. He probably outsourced these jobs to another country or a state with even lower standards in Texas if one existed at the time. If it was, it had to be somewhere else in the Deep South. The negotiators were stuck on a number I thought was too high. Over their dead bodies, they said, would they cap on punitive damages be anything lower than two times actual damages plus $1 million. Vance McMahon came to me, warning that the negotiations were tense, and Bullock might pull the plug on the whole package if we didn't agree. It was my first legislative test. One of the four cornerstones of my campaign was at a critical juncture. And the critical juncture, of course, to expand upon what George W. Bush won't tell you, is that corporate interests were at stake. And if he were to compromise on this and allow tort reform to be fairly moderate, then he would be letting down the only constituents he actually cares about, his rich-ass donors. A million dollars is too high. I can't agree, I told Vance, who agreed that as a matter of good public policy, the amount needed to be lower. We may lose everything over this, Vance warned. Explain we are working but we're willing to work with them, but I just cannot accept one million, I replied. So he already pushed the other party into accepting this proposal. And now he is trying to push them harder in this direction. That actually is a fairly bold move. But I seriously doubt that Bullock, who apparently enjoyed pushing right-wing policy and also enjoyed trying to bully people into worse positions, was bothered by it or pissed off at George over all this. Later that night, Republican Senator David Sibley was having dinner with me at the governor's mansion, discussing a different issue. During the middle of the meal, he was summoned to the phone. It was Bullock. You tell your friend the governor he's too stubborn and bullheaded for his own good. He's not doing the state right, Bullock told Sibley, who delivered the message. Sibley asked me what the problem was, then suggested a cap of $750,000. Uh, I said I could live with that, and Sibley called Bullock, who agreed. You're the greatest governor ever, said Bullock, when Sibley put him on the phone with me to seal the deal. How how does that make him the greatest governor ever? What the fuck? This, only, this can only be the case if one of Bullock's own major priorities is passing tort reform that is very favorable to large companies. I mean, what the fuck? The greatest governor ever. So other governors have done 
all kinds of things to help their state. Some of them really helped out during the Great Depression, or they built roads in the state which led to prosperity. They um, cleaned up state governments. They founded state governments in the case of some governors early on in the state's history. But George W. Bush, by making a mild concession on tort reform and getting 98% of what he wanted, is making this huge sacrifice that makes him the Jesus Christ of governors. Later, some of my tort reform uh, supporters tried to persuade me to work to lower the amount even further. But I had given my word. Bullock learned quickly that I could solve a problem and I would not be pressured, even though some who had contributed to my campaign were putting on the heat. Bullock and I had agreed and I would not back down. So basically, he's saying that he doesn't always give everything possible because he knows the limits of the political system and he knows what he can get. So the thing is, like all of the people pressuring you to pass legislation are going to press for uh, you to do as much as humanly possible, but they understand you probably can't. Bush is making it out like he's some sort of rebel because he did the bidding of his donors, but only gave them most of what they wanted rather than literally everything. But that is not at all unusual. Even the biggest corporate whores out there, whether we're talking about George W. Bush or someone like uh, Max Baucus from Montana, the most corrupt Democrat, all of these guys will never be able to give 100% because of political obstacles. In the case of Bush, Bullock made it clear he was not willing to work with a super low number, so Bush was forced to settle on 750. Bullock later told people that it was during the tort reform negotiations that I first earned his respect. So all this is, is an argument from authority. Bush is claiming that he has these great political negotiating skills because the legendary Lieutenant Governor Bullock said so. He was a great governor because Lieutenant uh, Governor Bullock said so. And he's tough because Lieutenant Governor Bullock respected him. All this is is a one major argument from authority and just a classic example of establishment bias. So he earned the respect of someone in the establishment, even if that person is of the other party, and that means that George W. Bush is an adult. As he mentioned, he was of the younger generation at the time, whereas his uh, friend Bullock was of the older generation. So this is effectively passing the torch and letting Bush officially into the political establishment of Texas and by virtue of that into the mainstream establishment of American politics as a whole. That moment also showed me how powerful a governor can be. When the lieutenant governor and governor, or speaker and governor, or even better, all three can agree on something, it's a tough combination to beat. Our roles, however, are different. The speaker and lieutenant governor are horse traders lining up votes. The legislative process is one of give and take, of agreement and disagreement. Their job is to figure out how to shape and mold legislation, to put together the pieces into a whole that can gather enough votes to pass. My job is different. A governor is a chief executive officer. I believe my job is to set its agenda, to articulate the vision, and to lead. So he put this in business terms, effectively, because CEOs just kind of release memos with general guidelines and then hire and fire personnel to get results. Also, the way that he lays out the job of a governor to set the agenda, articulate a vision, and lead in sort of an abstract sense without being hands-on, that is literally what Pete Buttigieg said in one of the debates about how he would lead, word for word. So I wonder if he read this book. Also earlier, Bush was talking about the you know working together and ma that making a strong. I wonder if Hillary Clinton was inspired by that now that she and George W. Bush are BFFs, and if that's where she got the slogan "Stronger Together." Maybe they were having a strategy sesh, and uh, you know because he obviously was actually supporting her rather than Trump due to things that Trump said about his family. And I wouldn't be surprised if George W. Bush was the inventor of "Stronger Together." That sounds like some lame-ass shit he might actually say. Yeah, actually, well, chances are it was Hillary's idea, but you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked, let me put it that way, if George W. Bush uh, you know, encouraged her to say, yeah, stronger together, that's a good one. 
That hasn't always happened in Texas. Often governors propose and legislators ignore. Each legislative session, the governor sends a budget measure uh, message to the legislature. It usually agree, is usually agreed with the yawn, dutifully reviewed, and shelved. The Office of Governor of Texas has frequently been described as weak, but I reject that label. The role is constitutionally limited, but there are plenty of weapons in my arsenal. A governor signs or vetoes every piece of legislation. A governor makes thousands of appointments of citizens who govern state body, state agencies, boards, and commissions. So effectively, he understands the power of appointments, and he would use that as president, both in terms of Supreme Court, but also all of the appellate courts. And he would, of course, fill up all of the executive agencies with his buddies. Only a governor can call a special session and set its agenda. Most part-time legislators have full-time jobs and don't like special sessions. As the end of a legislative session approaches, fear of a special session becomes an increasingly powerful negotiating tool. And a governor has the power of the bully pulpit, the ability to communicate with the public to articulate a message, an idea, an agenda. A governor sets a tone both for the state in general and for the legislative process. A strong person can make a powerful difference. And, and Bush's defense, well not necessarily defense, but let's just say in defense of his political skills and understanding, he did use the bully pulpit rather effectively as president, or at least he tried to in a number of cases, and that is actually something that any president who wants to have a successful agenda has to do. One of the only candidates right now running on the Democratic side who understands that is Bernie Sanders. He understands that the bully pulpit is the key power of the president when it comes to passing legislation that will actually change things for the better. Bush's agenda, of course, was not to change things for the better, but he did, did understand that any executive office in America when it comes to a political office your key responsibility when it comes to uh, governing is to set the agenda by using the bully pulpit. So amazingly, despite Bush's lack of intellect in many ways, when it comes to how politics works mechanically, George W. Bush's understanding is actually pretty damn solid. Part of the tone I wanted to set was one of constructive government. I was helped by a lieutenant governor and speaker who were committed to doing what was right for Texas and a history of bipartisanship in the Texas legislature. So by right for Texas, he means right for him and right for rich people, of course. I worked hard to foster that spirit of cooperation. I invited the speaker and lieutenant governor and all of the legislative sponsors, Republicans and Democrats, to join me when I signed the tort reform bill. He's making it out like this was some grand achievement, but it's clearly not a hard fight. All of these people were corporatist. Not one of them were opposed to tort reform. They were just haggling over the amounts. All of them wanted to suck the cocks of their corporate donors. We've learned from other places in his book that Texas had no campaign contribution limits. Rich people controlled the process lock, stock, and barrel. There was no debate or conflict here. Th this is a non-achievement. I wanted to share the credit to commend them for their hard work. Without them, it would not have happened. I knew that and wanted the public to know that as well. I invited the entire legislature to a picnic at the governor's mansion to celebrate my first hundred days as governor. And based on what he did during this first hundred days, i.e. focusing exclusively on tort reforms, I think that tells us exactly where his priorities actually were. This is what he wanted to do. That was his main job. His donors sent him there to protect corporate interest by passing tort reforms. Anything else that he did was fine, but it wasn't his main job. Same thing can be said of the Trump presidency. What was the first thing that Trump did? Tax cuts. After that, everything else he wanted to do was gravy. If he wants to build a wall, that's fine. Republicans, I'm talking about the donor class in the party, put Trump in office for two things. Tax cuts for the rich, deregulations if possible, we'll add that as a third maybe, and putting people on the Supreme Court. Those were literally his only jobs. Anything else he wants to do, who gives a shit? That's the same thing that's going on here with Bush as governor of Texas. He was there to help corporations. He was there to service the rich. That's literally it. 
I'm actually going to stop here. I will do a part two for chapter nine since this chapter is very long and I don't feel like recording all night. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and as always, remember, George W. Bush was a absolutely terrible president, he's a piece of shit, and he should never, under any circumstances, be redeemed.